Hi, my name is Neil Long, and I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement at Lyric Opera of Kansas City. Thank you so much for watching this pre-opera talk of our production of A Mall and the Night Visitors by John Carlo Menotti and featuring life-size puppets by master puppeteer Paul Mesner. From far away we come and farther we must go. How far, how far, my crystal star? These words sung in the cold distance by the three kings hold personal meaning to John Carlo Menotti. Born in Italy in 1911, John Carlo illustrates his childhood upbringing with a captivating anecdote published in the booklet accompanying the original cast recording of A Mall and the Night Visitors. He says, This is an opera for children because it tries to recapture my own childhood. You see, when I was a child, I lived in Italy, and in Italy we have no Santa Claus. I suppose that Santa Claus is much too busy with American children to be able to handle Italian children as well. Our gifts were brought to us by the three kings instead. He continues, I actually never met the three kings. It didn't matter how hard my little brother and I tried to keep awake at night to catch a glimpse of the three royal visitors. We would always fall asleep just before they arrived but I do remember hearing them. I remember the weird cadence of their song in the dark distance. I remember the brittle sound of the camel's hooves crushing the frozen snow. And I remember the mysterious tinkling of their silver bridles. Minotti's musical setting of the Three Kings song is evocative. Cavernous intervals of fourths and fifths played by harp and piano accompany their song with symbols and triangle adding an exotic flair. Just as the Three Kings song left an imprint on Minotti's childhood, Amal himself is equally moved, waking from his slumber to listen to their music in astonishment. Before we get to the story, however, let's go back in time to the 1950s, when Minotti was commissioned by NBC to write the first opera for television. Minotti had trouble settling on a story to tell. It was a chance trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City that reminded him of his childhood and inspired the opera that is now a holiday tradition for many. Hanging on the wall in the museum was the Adoration of the Magi, an oil painting on wood by Netherlandish artist Hieronymus Bosch. Painted around 1475, the painting features a strong perspective effect and use of gold leaf. The painting depicts a nativity scene celebrating the birth of the baby Jesus. Mary is seen at center holding her child, while shepherds, the three kings, and animals look on. Angels fly overhead, providing cover to the humble barn. A pastoral scene of the hills of Bethlehem appears in the background. This painted scene is similar to what one might see in an Italian presepio, known in other traditions as a creche or nativity scene. The painting immediately transported Minotti home. He reflects, To these three kings, I mainly owe the happy Christmas seasons of my childhood, and I should have remained very grateful to them. Instead, I came to America and soon forgot all about them, for here at Christmas time, one sees so many Santa Clauses scattered all over town. Then there is the big Christmas tree in Rockefeller Plaza, the elaborate toy windows on Fifth Avenue, the 100 voice choir in Grand Central Station, the innumerable Christmas carols on radio and television. And all these things made me forget the three dear old kings of my old childhood. But in 1951, he says, I found myself in serious difficulty. I had been commissioned by NBC to write an opera for television, with Christmas as the deadline, and I simply didn't have one idea in my head. One November afternoon, as I was walking rather gloomily through the rooms of the Metropolitan Museum, I chanced to stop in front of The Adoration of the Kings by Hieronymus Bosch. And as I was looking at it, suddenly I heard again, coming from the distant blue hills, the weird song of the Three Kings. I then realized they had come back to me and had brought me a gift. And what a gift it was! A Mall in the Night Visitors was first performed by the NBC Opera Theater on December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1951. 
Broadcast live from Rockefeller Center, A Mall on the Night Visitors was the debut production of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The show was seen coast to coast on 35 NBC affiliate channels, and an estimated 5 million people saw the live broadcast. Arturo Toscanini, conductor of the NBC Symphony, told Menotti, this is the best you've ever done. A Mall on the Night Visitors became an annual tradition, appearing on NBC every year between 1951 and 1966. Numerous recordings and films of the production have been made since, and the opera has, of course, made its way to the stage. It is frequently performed by universities, opera companies, and churches. At Lyric Opera, we are particularly excited to offer A Mall on the Night Visitors as an annual tradition in Kansas City, home, of course, of Hallmark. In the piano vocal score, Minotti offers production notes to guide companies producing the work. Regarding the characters and the action of the story, Minotti offers the following directive. Amal, a child, is the focal figure of the opera. Hence, all the action and even the characterization of the adult figures is dictated by this point of view. All these must be interpreted simply and directly in terms of a child's imagination. So, with a child's eye, let us hear the story of a mall and the night visitors. As a brief interlude plays, the curtain rises. The interlude is peaceful, with several melodies intertwining to set a tranquil scene. The music soon becomes lively, featuring a dancing oboe solo. It is night, and the sky is dotted with stars, the eastern star being the brightest among them. Outside a meek dwelling appears a young boy with a disability. He is around 12 years old, wrapped in a cloak, and playing a shepherd's pipe. A homemade crutch lies on the ground beside him. Inside, Amal's mother is completing household chores. The room is lit and kept warm only by a dying fire and a tiny oil lamp. Amal's mother calls for him to come inside and get ready for bed. Amal is resistant, but after some prodding, finally makes his way indoors. When questioned about what was keeping him outside, Amal describes the night sky and especially the enormous star hovering just above their roof. Known for his fanciful tales, Amal's mother is doubtful of his story. She becomes concerned for her son's welfare and resigned to begging to support her impoverished family. To cheer his mother up, Amal asserts that if they must go begging, a good beggar he'll be. Amal and his mother go to sleep. A brief interlude accompanies. Suddenly, the song of the three kings is heard in the distance. Amal stirs. Some time passes, and there is a knock at the door. Amal gets up to see who it is. A king, he shockingly reports to his mother. His mother declares nonsense and sends him back to bed. Another knock. Two kings, Amal reports. Nonsense, his mother replies. Another knock. Three kings, Amal says. I'm going to the door myself, his mother responds. To her surprise, there are three kings and their page standing outside the door. The kings tell her that they need a place to stay for the night. Amal's mother invites them inside, but notes that she has very little to offer. The kings say they can only stay for a little while in order to not lose sight of their star. They make their way inside, unloading a wealth of riches as they go. The mother goes to gather wood for the fire and instructs Amal to stay with the kings, reminding him not to be a nuisance. Once she's gone, however, Amal's curiosity gets the best of him, and he interviews each king. King Kaspar, perhaps the most eccentric of the three, and hearing impaired, shows Amal his box of treasures. Amal's mother returns. She replenishes the fire and asks Amal to go and gather the neighbors. The mother is enchanted by the riches in her cottage. King Melchior explains that they are gifts to the child. The child? Which child? The mother asks, thinking perhaps they are referring to Amal. The three kings describe the child, and as they do so, the mother becomes increasingly convinced that they are indeed seeking her son. The music and voices build to a lyrical crescendo. 
Suddenly the neighbors arrive, led by them all. They have brought food and other gifts to share with the kings, including a mysterious and rousing dance. King Balthazar thanks the shepherds for their gifts and bids them good night. As the shepherds are leaving, Amal shyly asks King Caspar if he has any magic stones in his box to cure his disability. King Caspar, hearing impaired, misses the question, and Amal is not able to get an answer. Everyone falls asleep except for the mother, who is entranced by the gold. She dreams about what she could do for her son with just a few coins, and after some debate, reaches for it. The page awakens and declares that the mother was intent on stealing the gold. The three kings and Amal rise as the page attacks the mother. Amal fiercely comes to her defense. After the confrontation, King Melchior says the mother may keep the gold, explaining that the child they are seeking doesn't need it. Let us leave, my friends, he says. The mother says she doesn't want to keep the gold and that if she weren't so poor, she would send a gift of her own to such a child. Amal selflessly offers his crutch to the kings, should the child need it. As to what happens next, you'll have to come see the opera. I assure you, you will be profoundly moved. Lyric Opera's production of Amal and the Night Visitors was created in 2020, largely in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The use of puppets, designed and choreographed by master puppeteer Paul Mesner, allowed for the safe performance of live theater. Puppeteers and audience members were to be masked with singers and instrumentalists socially distanced and, in some cases, protected by partitions. A creative team, consisting of a director, costume designer, and scenic designer, worked together to breathe new life into this timeless tale. The production was created specifically for the Lyric Opera Production Arts Building at 18th and Charlotte. The opera is scored for a large chamber ensemble, and in order to work for the space, the conductor, Pyotr Wisniewski, secured permission to reduce the orchestration to a total of nine players. The premiere performances in 2020 were to have a live socially distanced audience. A spike in COVID cases, however, necessitated a switch to digital delivery. In 2021, Lyric Opera was able to present live performances as originally conceived. However, young children were not able to attend due to the unavailability of the COVID vaccine. Finally, in 2022, all are invited to attend in person. And we've even added three school shows. A Mall in the Night Visitors has become a holiday tradition here in Kansas City, and we can't wait to see you in the crossroads. Keep an eye out for a new character in our production, a small cat with a big personality that we fondly call Snowball. At Lyric Opera of Kansas City, we have committed to a robust program of education and community engagement, all with the goal of promoting artistic literacy in Kansas City. Artistic literacy is defined by the Artistic Literacy Institute, is the ability to connect personally and meaningfully to works of art and through this process to forge connections to our humanity and the humanity of others. As you spend time with Amal and the Night Visitors, I encourage you to think about this. What can you take away from this story and apply to your own life? Enjoy the opera.